Actually, less than uh, 30 hours ago, I was standing outside Box Elder High School in, in Brigham City, Utah, offering tracks to Mormon youth and others through the bus windows. And it uh, wasn't too long after that I was facing a grim-faced policeman. And uh, there are times when you wonder if you're going to make it to meetings like these. Uh, well, thank God I'm able to be here. I wouldn't be a bit surprised there aren't some Mormons here tonight, and uh, I hope I do not offend any tender feelings, but uh, may I speak the truth in love. Uh, earlier that day, earlier yesterday morning, uh, Gary Wanis and I, Gary, why don't you raise your hand? Gary Wanis and I were staying outside Bonneville High School in Idaho Falls, and shortly after that I faced a very angry, uptight uh, assistant school superintendent. Uh, who declared what I was doing was illegal and threatened to call the resident policeman assigned to that campus. And um, however, he didn't show by the time we, we, were, we had left. Uh, he asked me what I was passing out and I offered him a piece of literature and he said something like, I thought so, and uh, drove off shortly after that. I'm glad I'm not spending the night in the Idaho Falls Jail like I did uh, part of a day in Salt Lake City about 14 months ago in the Salt Lake City Jail. Praise God. Well, I'd just like to share a few things with you. I'm involved in what you might call evangelism at risk, not evangelism at convenience. Uh, <laughs> by the way, I, I don't love to go up and down the state of Utah. I told my mom as I was leaving La Cunata, a few days ago, actually about six weeks ago on the start of the trip, that I wish I was coming back <laughs> already, in so many words. We had an exciting trip. Uh, Gary and I left about six weeks ago and spent about uh, 6,000 miles. We covered uh, approximately, uh, literature was distributed at about 50 high schools, including Arizona, Southern Idaho, and of course Utah. Uh, we got inside a number of seminaries, I did anyway, uh, Castle Dale High School, or rather Emory County High School. We were in there for about two hours. Got a chance to meet with the seminary principal. There was many as 60 high school kids in there. We got it on tape. If you'd like to uh, pick up an order for them back there, you can order it later. We went down to Arizona, had a bunch of literature printed up, about 12,000 uh, honest questions from honest LDS, all of which were subsequently passed out on the trip. We passed out about perhaps 17,000 pieces of literature and uh, had a really exciting time. Sometimes it was too exciting. I'm just going to share a, a few of the details with you. And you'll maybe get a little feel of what it's like doing this type of work. I'm leaning over here because the microphone is a little low and it doesn't seem to want to come up. So I'll just lean and you can listen. We went down to Arizona and got this literature printed up. It just so happened, by God's grace, the Mesa pageant was going on. The Mesa pageant was located right on the temple lawn. And there was some, something like 30 to 40,000 Mormons there in attendance over the, and others. Over the uh, four-night period, we missed the first night, which wasn't too bad. It was pretty windy anyway, I was told. Uh, it was a very exciting time. Some, uh, an ex-member of the Mormon bishopric named Mr. Robertson was there with some people. Uh, he's now a Christian, distributing literature. They were putting uh, tracks on the windows of the cars, which the uh, Mormon missionaries, some of them, were taking off the cars. And... Uh, I think the, uh, one of the members there hailed a policeman and said, uh, look at that, in so many words. And the cops said, hey, come over here, boys. And they ran off and disappeared into the crowd or something. But we had an exciting time. I was threatened to be uh, th threatened physically there twice. Uh, one fellow in Roman toga, one of the participants in the uh, pageant, uh, <laughs> jumped out of a pickup truck and asked me for some uh, dozen of the literature, approximately, for uh, some people. I started to peel him off a few and... Uh, he grabbed a bunch out of my hand, threw them in the back of the pickup truck, and uh, got in the pickup truck, and I declared to him that Jesus said, uh, the devil is the father of lies, John 8, 44. He wasn't too happy with that. Later on, he followed me down a road and uh, threatened to punch me in the face. I told him that Jesus uh, said, love your enemies. And I don't love my enemies like I should, frankly, but uh, I do mention that every now and then when I get in a tight spot. <laughs> and <laughs> this was a tight spot. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, I said, you wouldn't swing on me in front of all these people, would you? And uh, he declared he wouldn't. But uh, he t told me to move on. I went out in the middle of the street, and, and I was trying to hit the cars, the people in the cars. Basically, what I'm involved in is guerrilla warfare. You're trying to get as much literature out as you possibly can in the shortest amount of time. Uh, souls are at stake. It's a, it is a deadly business, actually. It's, it is warfare. It's very much warfare. 
and we did get some literature out. I got one track stuffed down my shirt. And uh, however, we did get a lot of literature out there. Precious souls for whom Christ died. Following that, we went up to uh, Cottonwood Valley, or rather Cottonwood, Arizona, in the Verde Valley. Stayed with some people there. Uh, distributed literature at Prescott High School. And over in Prescott, back to Cottonwood, distributed more literature there at the high school, more tracks going through bus windows. And uh, the Lord blessed me with a, a vision of the night of the rapture, which was very encouraging to me. From there, we went to Flagstaff, and from there, on to Fredonia, Arizona. Now, we were going to stop by a place called Colorado City, formerly Short Creek, Arizona, a polygamous colony of about 1,500 people. I hadn't heard good things about this place, and I wasn't uh, especially excited about going there, frankly, but A.N.R. Anderson encouraged me to go there, and he stood there a number of times to distribute literature himself with his wife. We stopped in Fredonia, Arizona, and an Arizona Highway Patrolman came into a restaurant there. And I asked him, what's the situation in Colorado City? And he declared to me that uh, it was uh, tense and they weren't partial to strangers. And he was right, they weren't. Uh, but I felt, a, you know, I felt a real peace as we were driving down there. I felt a real peace about going to Colorado City. So we got off the highway and just before we drove into town, we, we prayed and uh, we drove on in there. And he, was, he told me to stop in at the deputy sheriff's house on the right, second house on the right. If you're ever there, you stop in. And uh, these big houses right along the main drag. It's a prosperous polygamous colony, about 1,500 people. The uh, deputy sheriff wasn't there. One of his wives apparently came to the door and advised me to go to the gas station in town, which I did. And a uh, baseball game was in progress. Took that into note. And we went down to the gas station and talked to the gentleman in there. And uh, surprisingly enough, well, not so surprisingly, they practiced polygamy. They also believed Adam God doctrine. And... I wouldn't be too surprised they occasionally practice a little blood atonement on the side. I uh, heard of a person who used to be a member of that colony who um, said there were some mysterious disappearances there within the ranks of the colony itself. Well, anyway, you stirred a little literature and we were getting some very hostile stares. I mean, it isn't every day that a green van with California plates drives into town. And uh, we stopped and went to, uh, went, took some pictures around the town there, and went, there was a baseball game in progress, so we parked the van and uh, I advised Gary to maybe stay back because his hair was not quite, didn't quite fit into the, to the, uh, <laughs> the uh, motif, so we say, of Colorado <laughs> City, which was all short hair and blue jeans and so forth. Uh, I stood over and started watching. I took some chick tracks with me and some of my uh, heavier material. This is what I pass out, basically, honest questions from us to LDS, and uh, Brigham takes another look at Jesus. Um, so I passed out the chick tracks first, <laughs> and uh, I was looking over the, over the crowd, and they were looking no me over too, some of them. Believe me, you're getting some real stares, and not altogether friendly, I might add. And uh, so I kind of worked around the edge of the crowd, and a few people took them. There's some high school kids down at the end, and uh, then I offered them some of my Brigham Takes Another Look at Jesus tracks, and uh, some chick tracks, and worked my way back. I got a little bit of flack, and uh, from one person who told some kids I was offering some literature to, well, you don't want that, do you? No, we don't want that. And this type of routine. So I told him I hope he wouldn't be offended if I prayed for him. And uh, or I, I wouldn't be hassling him in so many words. And uh, he declared it wouldn't. I, regard, I don't recall the exact details of the conversation, but uh, shortly after that, I left. We got in the van, took a few more pictures, and were tailed out of, uh, up the highway for perhaps 10 or 15 miles. I got the impression anyway. There was a pickup truck came right up behind us, still light with the headlights on. And uh, I was making contingency plans, what would happen if uh, they pulled up in a hail of bullets, cut Gary down. But, uh, <laughs> I think I would have ducked. But anyway, uh, we went on, and uh, I'm just going to skip over the rest of the trip very, very quickly. We uh, stayed in Parowan. We visited the Mount Meadows Massacre site, which is well marked. Uh, nice memorial there to the, uh, the people. Uh, the plaque there read something like a uh, lamentable episode in the history of the West. There's 144 people in that wagon train. They were wiped out by white men and, in and Indians. John Doyle Lee was executed on the spot. Um, it's a rather sobering, uh, sobering thing. We went from there. We uh, went to Beaver, Utah, and distributed literature there at the high school. A policeman showed up and advised me if I stood in the school, school property, I would be arrested. And uh, but by the time we were all finished anyway, I was just talking to some students. We blitzed the business district, as we sometimes do, went to Richfield, Utah, 
a Baptist pastor there who meets in his home. He's been there for about four months. Already had about 25 people coming, crowding in, I guess, in that little, little home of his there. He couldn't find a single place in the whole town to have a church. And, uh, but he was trying. So he, had, he and I and uh, Gary went down to South Severe High in Monroe, a little town about nine miles away, and it was just great. We just passed out a slug of literature, had some interesting conversations with seminary teachers in the inside of the seminary building afterwards. And the next morning, I hit uh, Richfield High School, more literature out there. And then we went on to Emory County High School, which has a, um, a Christian principal, believe it or not, Christian principal. And I'd made, I told him about a year before that I'd be back and to go to his high school. He said, well, if, if you do, I'll, I'll call the police. But he, he was really in favor of what we were doing. And uh, we did distribute literature there. We ended up right inside the high school talking to students till about 6.30 that night. And uh, we're invited back to the Mormon Seminary the next day. We stayed with some ex-Mormons right up in Cleveland, Utah, and uh, two of the ladies there uh, told us about a lady who had a demonized house and a real poltergeist or poltergeist they're called. And this uh, demon was throwing its weight around. Uh, a man had shot himself there, one of the former owners. Uh, uh, the dog would growl and, and bark in the direction of where the guy had shot himself. Uh, the rocking chair would rock by itself. Uh, she and her husband were pulled out of bed by the ankles bodily one night. Uh, she was a very scared lady, nominal LDS, Helper Utah. Uh, I shared with her that uh, she really needed to receive Christ if she's going to have any protection because actually a non-Christian really doesn't have too much protection from these things. And she prayed to receive Christ right there in the house. And then we went from room to room and, uh, and went from room to room and ordered the thing or things out. And I called back about a week later and, um, and uh, they had no problem. At least I talked to one of the Christian ladies. There they were, about 60 students, and we had a, got a chance to present the gospel. And it's really neat because some of these kids, the only thing they have heard from day one has been Mormonism. And they do need to hear the other side desperately. And they were asking some, some questions and some real hard challenges. But anyway, uh, you, can pick it up, you can get the tapes later, order them. It was an exciting time, and we'll trust God that some good came out of it for eternity. Went on to uh, Utah Valley, where BYU is located. We went to two high schools there, on up into Salt Lake Valley. Went to some schools I'd never been to before. Uh, got a chance to speak right inside the Mormon Seminary to a Christian class, believe it or not. Sometimes the Christians will have seminary classes right inside the Mormon Seminary, because that's the only building available. However, uh, uh, by design, I'm sure the principal had his office right adjoining the uh, classroom where I was teaching, and he, ha he walked in the room and kept the door open. And uh, later on, when we hit that high school about two days later, he uh, had some caustic comments to make about what I was doing inside that classroom, but uh, teaching these Christian high schoolers. We went to um, Twilla High School, a school I'd never been to before. And as we approached the school along the south, south side of the Salt Lake, the rain was just coming down in buckets. <laughs> I mean, it was really coming down. You're we praying, oh God, you know, uh, uh, stop the rain. And uh, there was no way you can carry on effective evangelism when, when it's just a deluge. However, the, the rain wasn't quite that bad in, uh, in that town. And we got a lot of, well, a fair amount of literature out. Worked around the front of school. I was around the front and Gary around, around the back uh, in the student parking lot. You plan these things like a military operation. You, uh, if you have limited manpower, you just kind of cover the key exits or entrances. Get as much literature out as you can. We're sowing seeds, seeds of, of literature where there's a lot of verbal proclamation of the gospel. And it's always exciting. And perhaps I'll never forget those Mormon high school kids standing outside the Mormon seminary with the rain just coming down. They were getting soaked, and they're shivering, you know, and I was getting soaked. And, uh, and yet, they wanted to talk. They wanted to talk. And uh, there is a price to pay for evangelism. It is not, not something we do in lieu of our favorite football game or something like that. Uh, there's a time to get with it and to get out there and to do it. And we, we really need this in the Christian body today because there's a, a real lack of evangelism. There's a lack. There's a lot of talk, but there is a lack of real foot soldiers, people who are going to get out there and do it uh, because that's what God calls us to do. He calls us to pray, but the apostles didn't stay praying. They got up there and they went out to where the people were. And thank God there are some here who have gone out in outreaches and have uh, laid their bodies on the line outside of some Mormon churches or uh, stake centers sometimes and distribute literature. I was inside the Mormon seminary there and I was talking to the seminary principal and even then kids would come up and I'd hold the papers out like this or I'd just hold them out and kids would come up and take the papers. <laughs> then they'd come up and ask me right on the principal's nose. I mean, they'd say, hey, you got one of the little white ones or you got one of these. And 
And praise God, <laughs> that was neat. And uh, we had a little confrontation in the afternoon there. Uh, uh, Rowdy came up and uh, had a little chat with him. And uh, I got a, a nice compliment from one of the Mormons there. We uh, went on up and covered a number of high schools, uh, four high schools in Ogden. I'm just going to share this with you briefly. We got to Ogden about 7 o'clock in the morning. You don't get an awful lot of sleep in this ministry when you're on the road. About 7 a.m., case the campus. You drive around, you find out where the main entrances are. I'd been there once before, and it wasn't the most pleasant place, frankly, uh, the time I was there before, about two or three years before. But anyway, uh, we were there when the students started coming in. We covered two entrances, two key entrances of student parking lots. And uh, just about when I was, we were finishing up, when one Mormon came up along with a girl, and pretty soon I was surrounded by a group of Mormon rowdies. Uh, well, I might call them Jack Mormons, I guess. Swearing, uh, a lot of cursing going on. This is uh, not altogether unusual. Not altogether unusual, especially for the Jack Mormons. Not all Mormons are like that, though. I'm not saying that. But there is that, that element uh, who will threaten, who will uh, call you names, and so forth. When we left that campus, a um, fellow pulled up beside us, and we were driving for Ogden High School. We wanted to get that seminary passing period so we can cover all four high schools in Ogden in one day. And I drop Gary off at Ogden. I go on to Ben Loman High School. There's a public road between the seminary and the high school. Now, seminary is where they teach the kids all day long. There's, there's a constant stream during breaks. Kids going back and forth from high school to seminary. There's a public road. You just stand off to the side. You wait till the bell rings, the ring, and you run over there and start passing out literature. And so uh, we were driving for Ogden, and we were already late. We were already late, uh, running late, and this guy pulls up beside us and starts yelling at us from this little uh, pickup truck. And so, uh, what are you doing that for? You know, I said, well, trying to help Mormons. And finally he says, you're nuts, and he drives off. And so we uh, go over to the residential district, and we're heading down this main road for, uh, for uh, the high school there. And by golly, that same guy pulls right in front, only right in front of us this time, and starts slowing up a little bit. And Gary, Gary looks in the rearview mirror and he says, "Hey, it looks like we've got two more that have been following us behind us for some time." So I said, "Make a quick left at <laughs> the next, next opportunity." In so many words, so we hung a left and went down to a stoplight. Another left up into a business district, and we weren't we weren't trying to break the speed limit or anything, but uh, they didn't follow us anymore. So we went on down. I dropped Gary off, and I went to Ben Loman. Got there pretty much in the nick of time to hit the seminary passing period there. The principal or someone came out threatening me with a court order. And uh, I went back after finishing the job there. And Gary had a bunch of Mormons there. So I went on to Weber State College and hit a whole institute passing period. A whole bunch of them came out and a whole bunch went back in. And then I went back to resupply Gary with literature and got involved in a big conversation with about 30 students. And uh, well, these kids can really come up with some zingers sometimes. Uh, but it, it, it's exciting. They need to hear the gospel. They need, I don't care how hostile they are, uh, how obnoxious they can be sometimes, they need to hear. And uh, they will hear by God's grace if we pray that God raises up laborers for the harvest. Uh, went, we went back to uh, Ben Loman High, came back and got Gary after being, going back to Weber State again. We went back to Ben Loman High, got threatened with another court order from the principal there. Uh, apparently things were really stirred up. It's amazing what these little, how God uses these little, little sheets, honest questions from Austin LDS to stir up a, a whole campus sometimes. And uh, praise God, things need to get stirred up. They really do. Uh, you quote John 3.16 to a, a Mormon. That's nice. I already believe it. You see, sometimes we have to shake people up for Jesus. And we can do it in love. We can do it in love. We went on to a Weber High School, a big high school in North Ogden and uh, put papers out along, along the cars that were parked there. Put Gary over by one exit of the parking lot, I took the other one, where the buses come down the hill, and we had an interesting time, and a lot of literature went out, went back on the campus to take uh, a few pictures. They have a little Weber Academy, a little Christian seminary, r huddled right there beside this humongous Mormon seminary. And uh, offered some literature to the Christian seminary teacher, and then uh, a cop pulled up right behind us, and another one right in front of us. And we were there, and uh, they had heard that uh, we were passing out provocative literature. <laughs> and uh, if, if you want to get provoked, you can pick up some of the back table there. But uh, uh, he took our license, licenses and so forth, and they ran a check on us, and uh, they, they were scrutinizing the literature, and finally let us go. 
Praise God. That was one of, one of our better days. We hit Kaysville High School, uh, rather the big high school in, in Kaysville, uh, Davis High, and kids just, just come out of the woodwork there. Found out from the uh, guy involved in the city engineering that the uh, certain key street was indeed public property where the buses were parked waiting for their precious load of humanity. And is that right, Davis High? How about that? You graduated from there? Ah. Well, anyway, the kids just came right out of the woodwork there, and uh, we got a lot of literature out as we were getting on the buses, and the seminary teacher came out and got involved in the conversation with him for about an hour. Um, in fact, the conversation after he left, the conversations went on till 8.30 that night. It was from 2.40 in the afternoon to 8.30 at night. No potty breaks, no drinks of water, just go, go, go. And even then I had to pull, pull myself away from this one kid who just insisted on, on, on talking, insisted on talking. There are some fantastic opportunities in Utah, and I would encourage you, if the Lord leads, uh, to do a frontline-type missionary or just on a, maybe a, a one-week basis and see how it goes because there's such a need. You can stand for five days outside BYU, 25,000-plus students, largest private university in the United States, and distribute literature at key points around the campus. But there is a need for laborers, a real need, a real need. A lot of talk, but not enough laborers. And so I uh, went up in the Cache Valley and had a real time up there in Logan. Got, got permission to stand right on the campus at USU and distribute literature there. And just by God's timing, there was a lot of high school students, who, these FAA kids that were in there, as I recall. And they all, a whole slug of them came right out of the student union building. We, we, we just, just came up and we were distributing literature. It's really neat how God, uh, God's timing. It was, I had an opportunity to speak to some of the Campus Crusade staffers and others there. Uh, at least at least the head of Campus Crusade, and, and they wanted some uh, help in dealing with Mormons. Uh, Tremont in high school was really a rowdy school, a cowboy-type school. Some of these schools uh, could easily erupt into a riot, actually. I, I don't say that uh, jokingly, necessarily. Uh, they just, kids just came right out of the buildings after the uh, vice principal came out and, and uh, threatened me with arrest. Um, and pretty soon I was surrounded by a bunch of them. Some of them were swearing and some of them were mocking and some of them were taking literature. Praise God. I got one letter from an exchange student at that school uh, who was an exchange student from Switzerland who was not a Mormon. He wrote to me explaining some of the things that were going on there and his feelings. Uh, it was exciting. Brigham City High School, we went back about 3.30 the afternoon uh, for a meeting there and ended up in a restaurant talking with a young Mormon fellow and uh, his older brother. I think he was a returned Mormon missionary. Went up, on up into Idaho, stayed with uh, two Christian teachers, uh, excuse me, one Christian teacher, her husband was not a Christian yet. They gave us some valu valuable intelligence op information. I drove up the next morning to, to Incom, Idaho, and hit the kids that were getting on the bus to go 20 miles back down the line for this high school. Things, uh, things got stirred up there. Kids came right out of the seminary, and finally the principal drove out in his car and ordered them, uh, the remaining kids back in. Uh, went on up to uh, Pocatello, hit Highland High School. And one girl, a couple, few girls came back, and one of them tore the literature up and started yelling at me. And, and you never know what to expect. Uh, on to Idaho Falls, we did a little school hopping. We started at Skyline High, a big high school there, and uh, went from there to Rigby, where I ended up uh, right in front of the school. Gary was in back, hitting the student parking lot. I was out in front, and uh, the buses were coming and disgorging their precious load of humanity. And uh, it's an ideal opportunity. When there's buses there, always go for the buses because you can pass out tracks like cards at a card game uh, if you remember back to your B.C. days. And it's really, it's really neat. The principal came out and grabbed me by the arm and declared what I was doing was illegal. Uh, they were responsible, those kids, the moment they got on the bus, they got out of school. Of course, they were going to the Mormon seminary over there during school time, but anyway, don't worry about that. Uh, he called the police. Uh, the police chief drove up and, and uh, advised me to get into the car. I had a nice chat with him. While he was, while I was parked across the street talking with him, the kids were looking out at that arch criminal out there. Uh, Gary wasn't back distributing literature to the kids they drove on the student parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. So you never know what to expect. Actually, this, the police chief said that he was an ex-Mormon. He's a Presbyterian fellow. He says, I don't even know how I got this job, in so many words. But uh, we had a nice, t nice talk with him. And uh, he, d he declared it, uh, what we were doing was essentially hopeless, but it really, really isn't. It really isn't hopeless. There's always hope, and there are always some whom the Lord is going to get to, you know. I don't care how bad things look. And discouragement is sometimes a tool of the devil, and we just get down, oh, nobody's ever going to come to Christ. Oh, I might as well give up. Uh -huh. You know, and uh, 
But uh, don't give up. Don't give up. And cast your bread upon many waters. If you deal with one Mormon for 20 years and just that one guy, and at the end of 20 years he turns and bears you his testimony, walks off into the sunset, you've wasted 20 years. Deal with more people than just one. More people than just one. We were at, we were at a big high school, Smithfield High School in North uh, Cache Valley, and the uh, uh, two key entrances, well, there are only two entrances of the parking lot, and kids were just driving in there, one right after another sometimes. And uh, two guys dressed in suits came out and accosted Gary out there. When Gary wouldn't budge, they came over to me. And I walked back to meet them about halfway, so I just blocked the, the entrance to the driveway very nicely, so any cars that would come would have to go down to where Gary was, still standing. Okay. And so they stood out there and talked and, and uh, got very uptight, and one of them swore a little bit, and then we went and I went on the parking lot and picked up the, the debris. There are some fallen warriors. These things do get crumpled up sometimes. It's good, good testimony to pick them up. Um, I won't go through all the details of the remainder of the trip. Uh, Minico High was an explosive situation. Kids just boiled right out of the school. Uh, we got there about it's the open campus lunch. Uh, kids were coming out of the seminary, walking back to school, passed out a lot of literature to them. Driving off campus from two parking lots, uh, Gary took the upper one, I took the lower one, and pretty soon Mormons just started coming out of the woodwork. And I was surrounded by about uh, 50 of them, perhaps. Uh, papers were being bounced off my head. Um, <laughs> There was, there was some cussing, uh, rowdyism. Um, and one kid threatened to punch me in the, said he wanted to punch me in the face. Um, but uh, there were a number of kids who were listening. They were serious, sober. And perhaps the Holy Spirit was dealing with them, showing them that there were great things at stake, great things at stake. And a, a, a sober witness born in a sober spirit by the power of the Holy Spirit can be a very potent thing. About 15 Christian high schoolers came to Gary and asked for literature. And this literature will get spread around inside the campus. We'll get to the people uh, who want it. And uh, at that same high school, oh, it was about three years ago, Floyd McElvin wrote the book, Will the Saints Go Marching In? He used to be a pastor in Burley, Idaho. And there was a couple of Christian gals helping. One of them apparently left a track on a, on a windshield. A girl took it home to her mother, who is LDS church librarian. She got up tight, apparently called one of her friends in a situation. They ended up talking to Floyd McElvin. And uh, he led both of them to Christ. They both prayed to receive Christ anyway. And so some sow seeds and some reap. And so we're just sowing a lot of seeds. Praise God. Uh, let me ad address a few comments to the Christians at this time. Um, uh, there is, I, I notice as I travel Utah and southern Idaho and in other places, even here in California, there is certainly uh, somewhat of a live and let live attitude. Somehow uh, within Christian circles, um, there is the attitude that, well, you know, the Mormons are, are Christians after all, and they aren't really that different from us. And uh, if, they, if they would only take the time to, to study a bit, uh, Jesus is not the spirit brother of Lucifer, like Milton R. Hunter said in his book, Gospel of the Ages, page 15. Uh, Jesus was not begotten by the Father coming down and having relations with Mary in some way. Uh, Jesus is not just one in purpose with the Father. He is one in essence, a different Jesus, a different gospel, a gospel of works, the Mormon Third Article of Faith says we believe all mankind may be saved the atonement of Christ by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Is that true? Is, is there laws in the gospel? Paul gave a very sober warning. If any Mormon missionaries are dealing with any Mormons, uh, if the Lord leads, tell them this warning. Galatians 1.8, if we are an angel from heaven, preaches unto you any other gospel than what we preach unto you, let him be anathema, cursed of God. Accursed of God. And yet there are many zealous, 25 thousand plus, perhaps 27,000 this time, more missionaries going out and preaching a different gospel. Do you know what the gospel is that Paul preached? I oftentimes ask the Mormons, do you know? If I pointed you out in the audience right now, could you tell me what that gospel was that Paul preached? First Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel by which you are saved, going down to verse 2. And verse 3 said, for I delivered unto you as of first importance what I also received. He got a direct revelation from God. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures and was seen by Cephas or Peter and some others. Note one thing about that gospel. There's not a single law in there anywhere. I want to make a very radical statement. The moment you start putting laws into the good news, you just made a bad news because the Bible says, curses every man who's under the law, speaking of the law of Moses. Nobody ever makes it by the law. And I oftentimes ask for them as I say, tell me, do you know how many, how many Jews got saved by keeping the law of Moses? I have an exact number, but do you know? Zero. Romans 3.20, for by the law no man is justified in God's sight. Oh, but wasn't the law good? Wasn't it good? Well, the law was good. 
But what was the law given for? The law is our schoolmaster, lead us to Christ, we might be justified by faith, Galatians 3.24. A different Jesus, a different salvation plan, mission impossible. If you're a Mormon here tonight, are you trying to make it by 2 Nephi 25.23? Are you really saved by grace after all you can do? I asked a Mormon seminary teacher that in Castledale, Utah, and he declared he was doing all he could do. You mean you never have a bad day? He said he never had a bad day. That wasn't true. You see, we all have bad days. Nobody's ever going to be saved by grace after all that you can do. We're not programmed that way. Or Doctrine and Covenants, section 1, verse 31, 32, I, the Lord, cannot look upon sin in the least degree of allowance. Nevertheless, he who repents and does the commandments shall be forgiven. How many are going to make it by that, that salvation plan? No one. How many are going to become gods? When God said in Isaiah 43, 10, there was no God formed before me, neither shall there be after me. All vacancies are filled by him. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Some, some may say, ah, oh, but he's just the God of this earth. You see, there are other planets or planets yet to be created. But you know Deuteronomy 10, 14? God owns the heavens. <laughs> I mean, he does. He does. Now, oftentimes I ask Mormons, tell me about your God. Is he all-knowing? Does he know everything that's going on past the last galaxy? Oh, yes. Yes, he does. Well, that's right. The Bible says he does. Psalms 147, verse 5. He is all-knowing. His understanding is limitless. And I say, well, great. God says in Isaiah 44, 8, Is there any other God? There is no other rock. I don't know of any. Ah, you admitted God's all-knowing. He doesn't even know of any other gods out there. How come Joseph Smith said a council of the gods got together and concocted a plan to create the earth? Did he know more than God? Or is it true that Isaiah 20 says, They testify not according to the law and the testimonies because there is no light in them and they have no dawn. Think about that if you're a Mormon here tonight. There's much at stake, much at stake. Not just a, a church, a feeling. A feeling, Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ways are over the ways of death. Are you going to come up before God clothed in the rags and tatters of your own righteousness? Isaiah said all our righteousness is as filthy rags in God's sight. Isaiah 64, 6. Dear God, just thank you for Jesus who died for us. And, I, and God, I pray that no Mormon here tonight will be offended by what has been said. Uh, oh, Lord, just reach into their heartstrings and tug with the power of the Holy Spirit and bring them into your kingdom. Oh, God, may they each one realize how hopeless it is to try to make it partly on your good works and to throw themselves at the feet of Jesus who uh, went all the way because he knew we couldn't make it by our good works, oh, God. And Lord, uh, we who are saved, may we do good works, uh, not only for the reward's sake, but uh, to bear fruit for you and, and to be pleasing unto you. Lord, raise up in this last days, these last days, while the time is, is running short and the clock is, is getting toward the midnight hour, uh, labors for this harvest. Raise them up and may there be ex women for Jesus groups springing up all across this country. Oh, God men and women who with uh, fire in their hearts, may the gospel in their mind and their hearts and go in their feet. Oh God, just raise them up. Everything necessary for their support and especially the filling of the Holy Ghost. And Lord, may we, may we pray and, and work in this, in this harvest field. One of a number, but a, a very important one. God, bless each one here and bring the unsaved to you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.